Hello and welcome back to Complex Analysis and today we have part 22. And here we will talk about Gorsas theorem. Indeed, this here is the basic formulation for the famous result called Cauchy's integral theorem. Therefore, in this video here, we can actually show the proof as well. However, you already know, before we start, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget to download the PDF version of this video with the link in the description. Okay, and then, without further ado, let's immediately start with the formulation of Gorsas theorem. So here I should also tell you to distinguish this theorem from other theorems also named after Gorsas, it's often called Gorsas integral theorem. Now, here we are working in complex analysis, so you already know the basic ingredient we need for a theorem is a holomorphic function f defined on an open domain d. Moreover, as often the second ingredient is a curve gamma with the image in the domain d. And in fact, for Gorsas theorem this should be a special closed curve. Here this means that the image of the curve is a triangle in the complex plane. More precisely, this means here we have a starting point, then we go to a second point, then to a third point and then finally back to the start. So that's important here, gamma should be a curve like this. However, we also need more here, namely the inner part of the triangle, so all the points here, should lie in the domain D. Hence, you see, we don't want to run around a point outside of D. So you see, D is just an open set, so there could be a hole inside of it. Hence, the important part is that our triangle curve does not include this hole. Hence, something like this here is not allowed. So what we rather want here is a triangle like this. Ok, so these are all the assumptions and now we can conclude something for the contour integral of f along gamma. More concretely, as you might already know, we conclude that the integral is zero. So in summary, the closed curve integral for a holomorphic function is zero as long as we have a triangle that does not include any singularities of f. So you see, this is already a very strong result because it holds for any holomorphic function. Ok, so this is the theorem and for the rest of the video I can show you the proof of it. And in fact, we already have everything we need to write down the proof. Now the basic idea here is that we already know that the integral changes its sign when we change the direction of a curve. In other words, we know if we go to one point and go backwards again, then the integral is zero. So for example, an informal way to write this down would be to say we have zero when we first calculate the integral along the green curve plus the integral along the blue curve. However, by the definition of the contour integral, this would be equal to the integral along the whole curve when we put both curves here together to a new curve. So you see, the statement from above for such a curve here we already have. However, this is what we can use to prove the statement for triangles. Indeed, one important idea is now to just decompose the whole triangle. So let's start with our curve gamma like this. And now, on the way on the curve, we can just include such short ways forth and back. So for example, here at the start, we could go to the middle point here, then go to the middle point on the other side and then back again. Moreover, from the argument above, we already know that this short detour will not change the integral at all. However, now that we are back at this middle point here, we could go back to the next middle point on the other side. And also there, as before, we do it back and forth. And then we simply continue the route until we are here again and then we do the next detour. Hence, in the end, you should see, we have splitted the one triangle into four triangles. In fact, what you should see is that we now have four closed curves. And maybe we should give them names, so for example, let's simply call them gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3 and gamma 4. In other words, if we then combine all the curves here, we get this picture from above. However, now together with the basic idea we have explained before, 
we know that the contour integral along this complicated curve here is exactly the same as the contour integral along the curve gamma. Obviously, this is an important statement we should write down here. Now, in the next step, we can use the fact that we can split up this contour integral here into four separate ones. So you see, this is not so complicated. It's again simply the definition of the contour integral. However, now we have a nice fact here. The run integral along a triangle can be rewritten as four integrals along smaller triangles. And indeed, this helps us now because here on the right hand side, we just add up complex numbers. This means if we just look at the absolute values, we know there is a maximal one. In other words, what we want to use here is the triangle inequality for the absolute value in C. And now let's say that the complex number with the highest absolute value is the contour integral along the curve gamma j. Therefore, we get our estimate when we just substitute the smaller numbers by gamma j. So in summary, we see this absolute value here is less or equal than four times this absolute value there. And of course, this is an important fact we can immediately use here. And now to make our life a little bit simpler, let's rename this gamma j here. And I think a good name would be to call it gamma with an upper index one. Because then we can simply say that the whole procedure from above, we can now repeat for the smaller triangle gamma 1. And now let's say that we repeat this process exactly n times. This simply means each time the triangles get smaller and smaller. However, of course, the calculation from here stays true in each step. Therefore, if we continue with the names, where gamma with the index stands for the new smaller triangle, we get a nice new formula. Namely, the original integral is less or equal than 4 times to the power n times the absolute value of the contour integral along gamma n. Now, this is an important formula we need again, so let's call it star. However, you might have seen that we didn't use yet that the function f is complex differentiable. And exactly this is now what we use in the next step. But for this, we need a point where we calculate the complex derivative. Indeed, this can only be helpful if this point lies in all these triangles here. And as you might already see, the triangles get smaller and smaller and will converge to exactly one point. In fact, this is not hard to show and the completeness of the complex numbers guarantees that we find a point. Hence, let's simply call this point we find here Z0. So the important property it has is that it lies in the interior of all triangles. Hence, there we simply mean it's a point inside of all these triangles here. Okay, and with this point in mind, we can continue our proof. So in the next step here, we use the assumption that the function f is complex differentiable at this point z0. So please note, exactly at this point, we use that f is holomorphic and that inside the triangles, we don't find singularities of f. Okay, so now when you recall part six of the series, you know that complex differentiability at a point can be written as this formula. Or more precisely, it means there exists a complex number f prime z zero and a rest function phi. And of course, with the property that this equality and this limit is fulfilled. Or in other words, you already know, this is simply the linearization the complex differentiability explains. Now, the nice part for us here is that for the linear term here, we already know what happens for closed curves. Or more concretely, we already know that this function here has a primitive, an antiderivative. Hence, closed curve integrals give us the value zero. So we can conclude, if we want to calculate this integral here, this part here will vanish. Therefore, let's put this immediately into a formula. So the absolute value of this closed curve integral is the absolute value of the closed curve integral of phi. However, for phi you see, we already know a lot. For example, we see it goes to zero and even so fast that it goes to zero even when we divide it by z minus z zero. 
Therefore, we can rewrite the function phi offset with a new function psi offset times z minus z0. And then we still know that psi of z goes to 0 whenever z goes to z0. And now this is what we can use when we want to estimate this integral here. And of course, we can simply apply our standard estimate with the length of gamma n. So more precisely, we have the maximum of the function inside times the length of the curve. So you see, this is an estimate we have already used before. And now in the first step, we simply can substitute the function phi with the function psi. So in particular, you see, we can separate the whole thing then, and then we have the maximum of the function psi and the maximum of z minus z0. However, at this point, now you see we need more information because we want to estimate the length of gamma n. For this, we should go back to our original triangle given by gamma. Of course, you remember, the whole idea was to split it into four new triangles. And now let's assume that the length of gamma is given by a number r. Then, of course, the smaller triangle, gamma 1 we find here, has a smaller length. However, because we know we go to the middle points here, the length is exactly r divided by 2. And as before, this procedure we can continue, and then we know the length of gamma n is exactly r divided by 2 to the power n. So you see, this is not so complicated. We immediately have something we can put into the formula from before. Okay, then the next question would be, what can we say about the maximal distance between z and z0? For this, please recall, z0 lies inside the triangle, and z lies on the boundary. So obviously, the length here is smaller than the length of the curve around it. Hence, this means we can use the same estimate for this part as well. So in summary, we have our number r divided by 2 to the power n here and here. So you see, this gives us an estimate for the curve integral along gamma n. And now, finally, we can combine this with our formula star from above. So there please recall, this was an estimate for our original integral. And now you should see, this totally fits together, because this 4 to the power n will cancel with the 2, 2 to the power n here. Therefore, only r to the power 2 and this maximum here remains. However, we also know by the definition of the differentiability, that the function psi of z goes to 0 when z goes to z0. And of course, we know from before that this will happen when n goes to infinity. So in other words, in the limit n to infinity, the right hand side here goes to zero. So this means we can make the left hand side as small as we want. Or in other words, the left hand side has to be zero. And there we have it, this was exactly what we wanted to prove. Hence, Gauzat's theorem is proven. Therefore, I can say thank you for being with me until the end of the proof. And now you might already know, in the next video we will generalize this result. So I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye!